Hello everybody, this is Dr Christopher White and welcome back for part 3 of Mesozoic Life History Part 1. So before we go any further, let's just get the code word out of the way. The code word for this presentation is SMILEY. I repeat, SMILEY. That's S-M-I-L-E-Y, SMILEY. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, might I advise you to take a second and look up the works of the author John Le Carrier. Okay, let's get on to the dinosaurs. Now, there's something that I always need to make clear right at the start when discussing the dinosaurs, and it's this. There's no such thing as flying or fully aquatic dinosaurs. If they are fully marine, then they are marine reptiles. If they are flying, then they are either a flying reptile or a bird. The dinosaurs were limited to the land. Now, there were dinosaurs that could glide, and there were dinosaurs that could enter marine environments for short periods of time, but they would always have to return to the land. Now, the ancestor species for the dinosaurs is a group of organisms called the archaeosaurs. So, archaeo means ruling, and saurus means lizard. Now, it covers a pretty broad group that were the ancestors of crocodiles, pterosaurs, who are flying reptiles, dinosaurs, and eventually birds. And you can actually see a picture of an archaeosaur in the background here. And if you look at it, you can think, yeah, that actually has some pretty crocodilian features about it. So the archaeosaurs as a group obviously have several defining characteristics. However, the most obvious one is the fact that their teeth have individual sockets in the jaw. And if you remember in the previous presentation, we were discussing some of the important traits that allow us to differentiate dinosaurs from other reptiles. And one of those is the fact that dinosaur teeth had individual sockets in the jaw. And this is a trait that gets passed on to the ancestors of the archaeosaurs, so that's the crocodiles, the dinosaurs, the birds, the pterosaurs, etc. Now, in the case of the birds, of course, over time, the teeth have been lost and they've been replaced by a beak. Now, the likely ancestor of dinosaurs were small one-meter-long archaeosaurs called Eoraptors. Now, they've been found in middle to late Triassic sediments from South America and Africa. And uh, if you want to have a look, we have an Eoraptor skeleton down here at the bottom. And here we have a, a diagram showing you the approximate size of an Eoraptor versus a you know, standard human, about 1.8 meters. So the Eoraptors were a dominantly bipedal group of organisms. So that meant they walked and ran using their hind limbs only. Although their front limbs were sturdy enough to allow them to move on all fours for short periods of time. So, of course, if an animal moves on all fours, it is, of course, referred to as a quadruped, or it is sometimes referred to as being quadrupedal. So bear that term in mind as well, because it's going to appear later in the presentation. Now, the first dinosaurs had definitely appeared by the late Triassic. However, there is no one species that clearly marks the change from the archaeosaurs to the dinosaurs. Because, of course, we're dealing with mosaic evolution here, which means we've got lots and lots of small changes taking place. And so this means that the transition is more gradational than, you know, a sharp, well-defined shift from one group to another. Now, once we have the clay dinosauria established, it broadly splits into two groups. So the first group are the Saurischia, and these are referred to as the lizard hip dinosaurs, because, unsurprisingly, they have a pelvis that has a lizard-like design. The second group are the Ornithischia, and these are referred to as the bird hip dinosaurs because they have a bird-like pelvic design. Now, initially paleontologists thought that each order had evolved separately. However, over time it's become clear that they actually share a common ancestor. So this is the cladogram for the uh, group Dinosauria. So we have two limbs, so we have the Saurischian dinosaurs up here and the Ornithischian dinosaurs up here. So you'll notice there are seven subclades. So for the Saurischian dinosaurs, we have the sauropods and the theropods. And for the Ornithischian dinosaurs, we have the ornithopods, pachycephalosaurs, ceratopsians, stegosaurians, and ankylosaurs. And we're going to go through each of these subclades individually. 
Okay, let's move on to the dinosaurs. So the word dinosaur can be translated into one of two meanings. It can either be translated as fearfully great lizard or terrible lizard, depending on how you break down the word. Now, the original view of dinosaurs is that they were massive, slow reptiles who on the whole were rather unintelligent. Now, the picture that we can see behind the text here is of a couple of models of uh, dinosaurs that were produced by the in the Victorian era. So this is in the 19th century in the United Kingdom. And they're from an area of London called the Crystal Palace. So think of the Crystal Palace as essentially an exhibition centre from the 19th century. It was like a, a giant greenhouse made of glass and wrought iron. Unfortunately, it was destroyed in, a, I think, 1936, but it would have been a very impressive building. Now, around the Crystal Palace, they actually constructed a garden, and as part of the garden, they actually had an area which was given over to models of dinosaurs, or you know what they believed dinosaurs looked like. And so if you ever get a chance to go to London, I would strongly advise going to Crystal Palace and looking at this dinosaur garden because it's it's quite impressive to look at. But at the same time, it shows you how you know the view of dinosaurs has changed from being these massive, slow reptiles who weren't very smart to, in some cases, uh, you know, very fast, very intelligent reptiles. Now, over time, it has become clear that, yes, some dinosaurs were slow and rather unintelligent. However, some were tiny, some were fast. Some had very large brains by reptile standards, some were possibly warm-blooded, and some of them tended to their young after they hatched. So most of the time, reptiles just lay their eggs and walk away. So they are a very distinct group. So to just to think of them as, you know, big, lumbering, unintelligent creatures is highly inaccurate. And so here you go. You can see, so these are a couple of models of a dinosaur called Iguanodon. And this is what a Yuandon probably looked like. So this is the modern interpretation. So you can see the difference there. So what they've done essentially is they've taken the skeleton and they've put it into a, a, a crocodile-like format essentially. So, you know, they've made it a quadruped. You can see that it has a horn on its nose. And you can see they've made the limbs very, very heavy set, both the fore and the hind limbs. In contrast... A modern day interpretation of Iguandon will obviously make the hind limbs very overdeveloped because of course it was a bipedal dinosaur. Uh, the forelimbs would be a little bit uh, a little bit weaker. We can also see there's that spike. It was interpreted as being a nose spike here because they were taking a kind of a kind of rhinoceros view of where the spike would be located. But in reality there are actually thumb spikes designed for essentially digging, uh, breaking up plant material and possibly even defence. So you can see over time how the uh, how the models of, you know, the initial models of dinosaurs and how the you know, modern view of dinosaurs has changed. So just to give you some idea, by the way, we also know that uh, Iguandon was actually a herbivore, so it ate plants. But of course, the original view of Iguandon, and here's a, an example right here, an illustration from the Victorian era. You can see there's that horn on the nose and you can see it was actually interpreted as being a crocodile like predator. So, you know, you can see you know, over time how people have essentially applied their understanding of the reptile kingdom at the time to the dinosaur fossils and how over time we've begun to realise that this initial interpretation was very, very wrong. So, as we've discussed, the dinosaurs fall into two broad groups. So there's the Cerisian dinosaurs and the Ornithischian dinosaurs. So we're going to start off with the Cerisian dinosaurs. So the group Cerisia essentially has two subclades in it, the theropods and the sauropods, and we're going to start with the theropods. So the theropods were a group of bipedal dinosaurs, so they walked on their hind legs. They were mostly carnivorous. Now there are a few examples which might have been omnivores, but on the whole the group was generally meat eaters. And they ranged in size from turkey-sized dinosaurs all the way up to the massive Spinosaurus. So the Spinosaurus would have been in excess of 15 metres in length. Just to give you some idea, by the way, a fully grown adult Tyrannosaurus rex would probably have been about 12 metres in length. So the uh, Spinosaurus was a pretty gargantuan animal. Now, some specimens of the theropod dinosaurs uh, have feathers. Now, when we look at the feathers that we can find in the fossil record, they appear to be made of the same materials as modern day bird feathers, which would suggest a link between the theropods and the birds. Uh, 
Now, it's actually quite uncertain why feathers actually evolved. The most obvious reason is that they probably evolved for body temperature control. However, there's also the possibility that they may have evolved for display purposes during mating. They could possibly also have been for camouflage, maybe having feathers helps to break up your outline and make you more difficult to spot, or there could be some as yet unknown reason for the evolution of feathers. All we can say is that the theropod dinosaurs were definitely the group in which we see feathers appearing. Now, I'm just going to get rid of the text so we can actually see this picture of a Spinosaurus a little bit better. And you can see that it was actually a very, very interesting looking dinosaur. So you can see it obviously has this sail on its back. You can see it has this very long, very quite broad and flat tail. It has these very overdeveloped claws. And you can see it has this uh, very elongate skull with lots of teeth pointing out at seemingly random angles. So it was a particularly interesting looking dinosaur. And there's actually a reason for that. And that reason is because we believe Spinosaurus was actually one of these dinosaurs that would have been uh, semi-aquatic. So it would have uh, spent extended periods of time in the water. And then all of a sudden its design becomes a little bit more reasonable. So the sail, of course, helps to keep a portion of the body outside of the water. It allows the sail to, of course, absorb sunlight and thereby absorb heat and keep the reptile warm. The broad flat tail all of a sudden will think of it like a fish tail. That's obviously going to allow it to move itself through the water. The big long claws on the on the uh, on the forelimbs, well, they're probably for uh, for scooping up. Um, any animal that it can uh, that it can get essentially from these swampy or marine environments and then of course we have this very elongate uh, jaw full of randomly orientated teeth which would have been perfect for catching and holding fish. So Spinosaurus is actually a very interesting dinosaur which has evolved to fit a very limited uh, niche in the environment. So it's uncertain how the larger theropods hunted. So Spinosaurus, as we discussed, had special adaptations for hunting fish. However, other large species of theropod like Tyrannosaurus rex or Gigantosaurus, well, how they hunted is actually a little bit uncertain. So it is believed that they probably functioned individually, but whether they actively hunted like lions or whether they ambushed their prey like domestic cats or whether they scavenged is up for debate. So one of the things that we have been able to do is over time we've been able to look at you know skeletons of these larger theropods like Tyrannosaurus rex and we've been able to crunch the numbers and so when we do that what we can actually see is that uh, a dinosaur like Tyrannosaurus rex would actually have had quite a lot of difficulty running at any great speed. You know if it, if it started to run quickly there's a very good chance it actually would have shattered its own pelvis. So in all likelihood, it means that Tyrannosaurus rexes were either probably ambush predators or scavengers rather than active hunters who would chase after the animal they were trying to eat. Now, there is evidence, so from footprints and fossils, that some of the smaller theropods like the raptor, Utah raptor, would hunt in packs. And of course, this makes sense. If you're a smaller dinosaur and you want to overpower a larger animal, numbers is going to be helpful. So some evidence suggests that these packs might have been uh, family packs. There is also the possibility that Tyrannosaurus rexes could possibly have hunted in packs. So there's actually a Tyrannosaurus rex um, uh, set of fossils there from Alberta. So it's a trackway and you can see this, the trackway in question here. So you can see one Tyrannosaurus rex footprint here, another one here. You can see the, the three toed foot. You can see another one over here. And what we have in this particular trackway is we actually have the paths of three Tyrannosaurus rexes all moving parallel with one another. Now you could interpret this as three Tyrannosaurus rexes working together to try and catch a, uh, a large prey item. However, you could also interpret it as you had three Tyrannosaurus rexes walking in the same direction in the same area during the same, you know, you know one or two day period for instance so it you know although it hints at the possibility that Tyrannosaurus rexes could have hunted in packs it doesn't definitively say so in the case of the track marks that we have for animals like Utah Raptor what we see is we see the trackways actually cross over each other and we can see one footprint being stepped on top of another older footprint which would suggest that we have groups of these smaller raptors all moving simultaneously all crisscrossing over each other's tracks and so that would suggest that, yes, they definitely are moving as a pack. When it comes to these larger theropods, it's far more uncertain. 
So the other group of Cerisian dinosaurs are the sauropods. Now, the sauropods contain the massive quadrupedal herbivores, including animals like Diplodocus and Brachiosaurus. So these are these massive dinosaurs that had the big, long necks. So they were the largest land animals to ever have lived. And there's a particular uh, subclade of the sauropods called the uh, Titanosauriforms. And they were by far and away the largest. And this clade uh, includes dinosaurs like Brachiosaurus, Argentosaurus, and an as yet unnamed 77 ton dinosaur that would have been about 40 meters in length and about 20 meters tall. So that's about twice the size of Brachiosaurus. And Brachiosaurus was a big sauropod. So they were preceded by the smaller late Triassic to early Jurassic prosauropods. We can actually see a prosauropod illustration down here in the bottom right. So the prosauropods were actually probably bipedal, but you can see the basic design already present. So you can see this very elongate neck. And that's a strong indicator of a link between the prosauropods and the sauropods. Now, trackways for sauropod dinosaurs show that they moved in herds, and they probably did this to protect their young. So a, a fully grown sauropod dinosaur would have been a very difficult animal to attack. So, you know, they probably think of them like modern day elephants. There aren't really any animals that are going to go actively hunting elephants with the exception of humans, and we can only do that because we have guns. So think of a sauropod as an elephant it's pretty much impervious the only time they're really in any risk is when they are young and so the way the elephants get around that is to move in large groups where the adults can protect the younger elephants and it's probably uh, a similar mechanism was probably working with the sauropods with the adults protecting the smaller younger sauropods so the sauropods were common during the Jurassic, however they don't really make it into the Cretaceous in any great numbers, and this is due to environmental change. So if you think about it, the sauropods being such huge dinosaurs are going to require very, very large quantities of plant material. And of course what happens is, as we've discussed, as we head into the Cretaceous, we have changes in global climate caused by the continent shifting more towards their modern positions. Of course this changes ocean circulation and air circulation, so that's going to affect, you know, the uh, the environment. It's also going to lead to seasons beginning to appear, so you'll have a, a warmer summer season and a colder winter season. And of course, if you're a reptile, you definitely don't like the colder winter seasons. And at the same time, of, uh, during the Cretaceous, we also have this very, very large uh, marine transgressive event. So sea levels go up anywhere to 250 metres above present day levels. This, of course, means that large areas of the continent become inundated. And of course, that gets rid of all the plant life in those areas. They're no longer accessible to these dinosaurs like the sauropods. So they can't feed them, you know, in that area. So the amount of uh, available land they can actually feed off is reduced and the amount of of you know plant material they're used to eating is also reducing due to climatic changes and of course this means to leads to a you know, pretty significant decrease in their numbers as we progress from the jurassic into the cretaceous so during the Cretaceous, as I said, the climatic changes caused by the break of Pangaea, increased competition and the change in sea levels led to a decrease in sauropod numbers and diversity. Now, there was one location in which the sauropods managed to hold on during the Cretaceous and they did very, very well. And this was in South America. And so this is where the group, the uh, Titanosauriforms, make their appearance. These really, really big sauropods. And they managed to do that in this area because, number one, the food supply stays pretty constant. So they, you know, there's plenty of stuff for them to eat. But they also enter an arms race. So the predators in what is now modern day South America during the Cretaceous started getting bigger. And so in order to make themselves you know, more difficult to attack, the sauropods also start getting larger. And essentially you have this arms race where the predators keep getting bigger. So the sauropods keep getting bigger. And, you know, over time that leads to the formation of some absolutely massive sauropods. Now, Recent evidence suggests that some of the Titanosauriforms actually managed to migrate from South America 
to Australia in the very late Jurassic to early Cretaceous, and they would have gone via what is now modern-day Antarctica. So they would have taken the path approximately marked out here in red. So the Titanosauriforms weren't just limited to South America. They did manage to migrate, it would seem, but the vast majority of them were limited to what is now modern-day South America. So just to give you some idea, by the way, so here we have some classic examples of sauropod dinosaurs. Of course, we have Diplodocus here, and you can see, once again, we have this very long body, very long tail, very long neck, and, of course, a very small skull. And we know that the sauropods would have been grazing dinosaurs, so they would have uh, eaten plants and, and tree leaves. We have uh, Brachiosaurus over here, and we have Argentosaurus down here. Now, one of the questions that we have with the sauropods is, of course, if you look at the length of the neck, you can imagine just how difficult it would have been to have gotten blood from the main torso all the way up this neck to the head to keep the brain alive. And so uh, a lot of the interpretations initially of the sauropods was that they would have had their neck up in the air like this, but of course that would put tremendous strain on the heart. So what we actually think is the vast majority of sauropods would have uh, been organized more like this, with the head approximately level with the body. And this would have essentially have put less strain on the heart because it would have been easier to have pumped the blood horizontally rather than trying to pump the blood vertically. And this would have been better for the dinosaur as a whole. But of course, it does somewhat limit its, uh, its ability to graze the tops of trees. So our initial model for the sauropods is that they would, you know, because they had this long neck, they would graze the best leaves at the top of the trees. And so that gave them an advantage over other dinosaurs. However, if they have to keep their heads you know, on, on a more horizontal plane, obviously that limits how high they can lift their head before they start getting dizzy. And so, you know, this also needs to be you know, uh, borne in mind. Now, just to give you some idea, by the way, uh, an adult blue whale, which is the largest animal on the planet right now, averages about 28 meters in length. So an animal like Argentosaurus would be, you know, longer than your average blue whale. So that gives you some idea of the huge size of these creatures. So now we have to think about the group Ornithischia. So these dinosaurs have bird-like pelvises. Now, this wasn't the only difference from, from the Cerisian dinosaurs. They also had no front teeth. So the front teeth of the uh, Ornithischian dinosaurs were actually replaced by beaks. And these beaks were helpful because it allowed them to essentially bite through very hard, very tough vegetation. And remember, for a lot of the Mesozoic, they would have been dealing with very hard, very tough vegetation. So think of a plant like a sago palm. If you've ever, you know, ever touched a sago palm, you'll know the, uh, the, the leaves are very, very hard. They're very tough. It would take quite a lot of effort to actually... Um, bite them and actually manage to you know break them down and swallow them so you know having this beak allows them essentially to nip off these you know these hard leaves and these you know quite hard branches so that they can then be chewed up and digested we also see that the uh ornithischian dinosaurs have ossified so that's bone-like tendons in their hind region now once again i don't know what kind of evolutionary advantage that offers them all i can tell you is that they do so the uh, Ornithischian dinosaurs are split into five groups. So we have the Ornithopods, Pachycephalosaurs, Ankylosaurs, Stegosaurians, and Ceratopsians. So let's start with the Ornithopods. So the Ornithopods are a very successful group of herbivorous dinosaurs that were extremely common in the Cretaceous. So from the skeletons that we have, we can see that they functioned as bipeds most of the time, but they did have the capacity to move as quadrupeds as well. So when we actually look at the skeletons of ornithopod dinosaurs, we can see that the younger examples have most of the wear and tear on their knee joints, which would suggest that they're moving as bipeds. However, when we look at the older ornithopod skeletons, we can also see quite a lot of wear on the elbow joints. And this would suggest that when the ornithopods are younger, they're moving as bipeds, but as they get older and they get a touch of arthritis maybe in their hind limbs, they can move to being more, more of a quadruped and that helps to take some of the weight off the hind limbs. 
Now, the most successful group of the ornithopods are a group called the duck-billed dinosaurs, the hadrosaurs. And they were very, very common during the Cretaceous. And they were an extremely successful group who managed to outcompete other herbivores in a, in a very big way. So they became very numerous, lots of different species. And this success was mostly built on their teeth. So what we can see is that over time the ornithopods uh, slowly changed their tooth design and by the end of the Cretaceous the hadrosaurs had managed to come up with a system of chewing that would have been about as efficient as that of a modern day cow and that's a very efficient chewing system and this obviously would have meant that because they could extract the maximum amount of nutrition out from this plant material it would have meant they you know needed needed to eat less and it would have main, meant on the whole they were going to be more successful and more capable of out competing other herbivores that were around at the time now a lot of the hadrosaurs actually had crests on their head and from what we can tell these crests would have actually acted like amplifiers or echo chambers and this would mean that the bellows that the hadrosaurs would produce would be extremely loud and so they could be used for communication so for warning that there could be a predator nearby or they could be used for the selection of mates now one particular hadrosaur called uh, Miosauria or good mother dinosaur uh, built two meter wide nests at seven meter intervals and the amazing thing is is your average Miosauria was about seven meters in size so they very carefully spaced the nests out to make sure they were as closely packed together as they could but there was also enough room for a normal sized Miosauria to walk between them without crushing the eggs. And one of the things that we can see is that some nests contain juveniles up to one meter in length. Now those are obviously much too large to be a newborn dinosaur. And this would suggest that Miosauria, unlike other reptiles, actually took care of its young for extended periods of time. So, you know, it took care of them all through their adolescence. You know, most reptiles simply lay their eggs and then they just walk away and let the young fend for themselves. So this gives you some kind of, this gives you a hint at the kind of methods that dinosaurs were using to be more successful than other groups of reptiles. And this willingness to stay with their young and help them reach maturity is on the whole going to be a very successful strategy because that means you're going to have a greater number of young making it to adulthood. And so just to show you, here is an example of a hadrosaur. And you can see, you know, it has the very big, strong hind limbs. So it's a mostly bipedal animal. But you can see that the front limbs could also be used for locomotion as well. You can see here's, this is, here is this bony bill, which is used for essentially biting off hard plant material. And behind there, inside the mouth, there would have been banks of chewing teeth, which would be designed to obviously break up the plant material and pulp it before it was swallowed. So the next group are the Pachycephalosaurs. Now this is a group of bipedal dinosaurs, they're herbivores again, and they are very distinct because they have a very thick boned dome-shaped skull. So the top of the skull in particular was very very overdeveloped. It had a big thick layer of bone up there. Now, the species of Pachycephalosaur varied in size between about 1 and 4.5 meters in length. So they weren't particularly huge by dinosaur standards, but they weren't tiny either. They were pretty medium sized. And they appear to have lived on the northern hemisphere continents during the Cretaceous. So we find examples of them in Europe, we find examples in North America, and we find examples in Asia. And of course this makes sense because if you remember when we're talking about the position of the continents during the Cretaceous of course we know the southern hemisphere continents are fully detached from the northern hemisphere continents at this point so you know there's no way the Pachycephalosaurs could be present on the southern continents so that means they would have been limited to the northern hemisphere and we also know that for much of the Cretaceous North America, Europe and Asia were attached to each other so obviously that would have meant migration between them would have been possible. Now, the need for this very overly thickened skull is uncertain. So the traditional view is that Pachycephalosaurs would butt heads like modern day rams for dominance within the pack or herd or, for, or during mating displays. 
It's also been suggested that the over-thickened skull could possibly also have been defensive, with Pachyocephalosaurus possibly charging predators if they felt threatened. Now, obviously, this would be extremely brave if the predator in question was a Tyrannosaurus rex, but, you know, for smaller predators, it may have been sufficient to have scared them off. And just to show you, so here's an example of a Pachycephalosaur. So you can see the hind limbs are very overdeveloped, so that's clearly showing us it was bipedal. The forelimbs tend to be smaller, and they're probably mostly used for grasping plant material. You can see once again, here's this bony beak at the front, and you can see here we have this very overdeveloped skull, which, you know, we're not totally sure what the reason for it was, probably used for butting heads. So the Ceratopsians are a group of horned dinosaurs that first make their appearance in the late Jurassic and then they persist into the Cretaceous, where they're actually quite successful. So the Ceratopsians are quadrupedal herbivores, and of course the most classic example of the group is going to be the dinosaur Triceratops. So the fossil record for the Ceratopsians is actually pretty good. Now this is because their skeletons on the whole are very very robustly built and so this means they are more likely to successfully fossilize. So this also allows us to track the evolution of this particular group very effectively and we can see in particular how the neck, frill and horn design changed over time particularly throughout the Cretaceous. So the earliest example of a Ceratopsian is a Chinese species called Yinglong uh, it was about 3 metres in length and weighed about 65 kilograms. So that's about the same as a baby rhinoceros, so it, it was a big animal. So from what we can tell, it was bipedal, and it possessed a few ceratopsian features. So you can see right here at the top of the skull, we have the start of the neck frill right there. Now the interesting thing about Yinglong is that it also possesses some features which are present in the Pachycephalosaurus. And so this would suggest it's an intermediate species between the Pachycephalosaurs and the Ceratopsians, and so that would suggest that it's a common ancestor for both groups, so they're related to each other. Now we have numerous Ceratopsian trackways, and we also have the formation of bone beds, which contain uh, several Ceratopsian uh, individuals which appear to have died at the same time. And both of these indicate that the Ceratopsians would move as a herd. So once again, think of them probably more like modern day elephants with the adults moving in a herd to protect the younger, smaller Ceratopsians. In terms of the bone frill itself, it appears to have been primarily defensive, or it could possibly have been for mating display. So a lot of the bone frills that we have are made of solid bone, and that would be a great defensive structure. So it's going to protect the neck, and that's going to stop dinosaurs like Tyrannosaurus rex being able to bite down on the top of the neck and easily kill the uh, Ceratopsian. Now, some Ceratopsians, though, on the other hand, have extremely overdeveloped neck frills. In fact, the neck frills are so large that what's had to happen is some parts of the, uh, the neck frill have essentially had to become hollow, so there's no bone there. And, of course, that means the neck frill is going to be very, very large, but it also means it's not going to be a particularly great defensive structure. And so in those instances, it's probable that the neck frill had actually probably become more for display purposes, you know, in, in terms of mate selection. Now, when it comes to the horns, the primary reason for having the horns is probably defensive. So let's face it, if you were coming up, well, you, know, you were going to try and eat a triceratops, you would definitely think twice about it because those are some pretty vicious looking horns there. And they could also have possibly been used for competing with mates. So they could once again possibly have uh, butted heads like modern day rams. Now this obviously would have been extremely risky when you, you know, look at the types of weaponry that these dinosaurs were equipped with. So, you know, chances are most of the time the horns were purely for de defensive purposes. So as we can see when we look at the Ceratopsians, we can see that all the four limbs are very overdeveloped, which would suggest they are quadrupeds. They obviously have this neck frill for primarily for defense, maybe for display purposes. They obviously have the horns, probably primarily for defense, but possibly you know also for uh, mating purposes. And of course, once again, they have the bony beak at the front for biting off uh, hard, you know, robust plant material. And of course, as you can see in the picture here, behind there, there would have been banks of chewing teeth that would have pulped the food before it was swallowed. 
So the next group of dinosaurs are the ankylosaurs. So this is, again is a group of quadrupedal herbivores and they are very distinctive in that they have a very stocky, heavily armoured body. Now, because they are just so well armoured, they are arguably the slowest of all the dinosaurs, and they probably would have had a top speed of about 10 kilometres an hour if they really went for it. To give you some idea, that's about the same speed as a power walker. So if you've ever seen the Olympics and you've ever seen power walking, you'll know it's like walking just a little bit faster. So the Anglosaurs make their first appearance in the Middle Cretaceous, and we have examples from North America, Europe, and East Asia. And once again, this makes sense, of course. In the Cretaceous, North America, Europe, and Asia were still connected, and so migration across those three continents would have been doable. In contrast, there are no examples in the Southern Hemisphere continents, because, of course, they were separate, uh, separated from the Northern Hemisphere continents at that point, so there was no way that these dinosaurs could ever possibly have gotten there. So the bony armour covers the head, the back and the flanks of the animal, so that's the sides. And some species of Ankylosaur also possessed a large bony club at the end of its tail, which would have been for defensive purposes. So if a predator was to attack an Ankylosaur and, you know, and the, the bony club wasn't sufficient to scare off the predator, the Ankylosaur could simply have lied down, relatively safe in the knowledge that its, uh, its armour probably would have been sufficient to have frustrated most predators. So at a weight of about 4.5 tonnes and a length of about 9 metres, you know, it would have been pretty difficult for a large predator to have flipped over an Ankylosaur. So even, you know, a dinosaur like Tyrannosaurus Rex probably would have, you know, had a very difficult time attacking an Ankylosaur. So if we look here, here we go, you can see the design is very, very low to the ground. We have four overdeveloped limbs, so it's definitely a quadruped, and you can quite clearly see this overdeveloped armour running along from the top of the head, down along the back and all the way up the tail. You can also see we have uh, developed armour on the sides of the animal. And of course we have this bony club at the end here for defensive purposes. So the final group we're going to look at are the Stegosauria. So the Stegosauria are a group of quadrupedal herbivores and the later examples of the group had rather overdeveloped hind legs. Now the overdeveloped hind legs actually in some cases became so large it would have affected the animal's ability to run and you know, this isn't a huge shock because the Stegosauria on the whole are quite large animals they probably wouldn't have been that quick. If you look at the way they're designed they're more set up for defence rather than fleeing. So we don't know whether Stegosauria moved in herds or individually we just don't have enough fossil or trackway evidence to say definitively either way. So the group existed from the late Jurassic and made its way into the early Cretaceous. Unfortunately, in the early Cretaceous, it began to be very heavily outcompeted by the ornithopods, the ceratopsians and the ankylosaurs. And so unfortunately, that meant they were very quickly outcompeted and so they became extinct in the early Cretaceous. Now, fossils for the last common ancestor, so between the uh, group Stegosauria and other groups of dinosaurs, indicates that there is a link between the Stegosaurians and the Ankylosaurs. Now, this makes a lot of sense. I mean, if you look at the Stegosaur design here, you can see it's a very stockily built quadruped close to the ground, just like the Ankylosaurs. You can see it has a defensive uh, tail arrangement, in this case spikes. In the case of the Ankylosaur, it's a bony club. And you can see it has rows of spines down the back. In this case, as you can see, it's a Stegosaurus picture, so it has the plates. But earlier examples would have had spines along the back, a lot like the Ankylosaurs. So Stegosauria fossils are found in North America, Europe and Asia. They're not really present on the Southern Hemisphere continents. Now, although the most well-known member of the group is, of course, Stegosaurus, and Stegosaurus had bony plates down its back, and you can see them in this picture in the background. However, some of these uh, other species in the group, particularly early species of uh, Stegosauria, didn't have the plates. They actually had spines on the back, which were would have been primarily for defence. And this is a trait that's shared with the Ankylosaurs. So if we just go back to the previous slide, you can see here is our Ankylosaur model. You can see stockily built quadruped, just like a Stegosaur. 
defensive tail structure, just like a stegosaur, ridges, uh, rows of spines along the back, just like the early stegosaurs. So you can see there's a reasonably strong link between these two groups. Uh, in terms of the stegosaurs themselves, uh, tail spikes were present in nearly all species, and they, of course, would have been primarily defensive. Now, the overdeveloped hind legs, especially in the later examples of the group Stegosauria, would have meant that the hind quarters of the animal would have been pointing in the air. And this has a couple of advantages. The first advantage is it means the head is naturally pointing downwards. And this is going to make it easier if you're a grazing animal. So, you know, if you're eating plants that are close to the ground, well, it means your head is just naturally set in the kind of position that's going to make your life easy. The other situation is because the hind legs are so overdeveloped and it's forcing the hind quarters into the air, it means that the tail is naturally going to be quite high. And this means that the tail would have been sweeping from side to side at about the, the head and body level of most large predators at the time. And so this would mean if you were something like a uh, like an Allosaurus and you decided you were going to attack a, uh, a Stegosaur, you would have been taking a pretty big risk because you could say with relative certainty there would be a giant spiky tail heading straight towards your head at great speed. So, you know, so it's a, it's a good defensive mechanism. And of course, as we've already touched on, these are very big, very slow dinosaurs, so running away isn't really an option. So, you know, having, a tail, uh, having tail spikes for defense makes a lot of sense. So the use of the back plates that most of the later stegosaurs have is uncertain. So we can see the early stegosaurs have these spines on their back and they are going to be for defense. So, but over time we see these spines beginning to become less common and bony plates becoming more common. So the reason for them is uncertain. They would offer a certain amount of defense. I mean, they're going to get in the way of a predator if it tries to attack the top of the body. They could possibly have been for display for mating purposes. Or one of the other options is they could be for heat exchange. So the um, so the Stegosaurus in the morning could have pumped blood into the uh, the plates here. It would have been heated up by the sunlight, and so it meant the uh, the blood would have warmed up faster, and that would have meant your Stegosaur could have gotten going faster. You know, at the start of each day, it also meant that if the Stegosaur got too hot, if it could find a shady area, once again it could pass blood through the plates here. The large surface area would have meant some of the heat from the blood would have been lost to the surrounding atmosphere, and so that would have helped to have cooled down the blood and therefore cooled down the dinosaur. So the exact reason for the plates is uncertain. And once again here we go so we can see we have a, a, an illustration of a stegosaurus in this case and you can see overdeveloped quadruped we can still still at the bony beak we can see the plates along the back and we can see the defensive uh, spiky tail structure. Okay everybody that's it for part one so thank you for watching and take care.